35 years ago, I departed in December 78. Now, 71 years ago, I was flying one like this over Europe, getting shot at. A couple years later, I was a flight instructor in the big B-29. I didn't get shot at in it. <laughs> now, on my birthday in uh, 43, I went on the toughest raid of all. But two months before then, this picture was taken on my third raid to Kiel in northern Germany. That's what an explosive 20 millimeter cannon shell will do to a blade of a prop. 20 millimeter about equal to 80 caliber. Now that day, I got hit on the shoulder by a fragment from a 20 millimeter that had come through the window there and hit me on the shoulder, tore the leather jacket, but didn't hurt me.
and we are about 32 degrees here in Jackson. Okay, the next two lanes were each 13 hours, 2,400 miles. I had been to San Diego in this airplane the previous July, I had extra gas tanks put on each wing tip. So instead of landing in LA, I was going to go to San Diego because I knew those folks there. So when I got to LA on this round the world trip, I had been around the world. You know what I decided? That the world was round and a little bit more water in the Pacific than I realized. <laughs> now I'm gonna go over this round in detail, but I'm gonna skip Saipan the first time, and then we'll go back and get Saipan since this is the main focus of today's program. I had a brother in the Marines in the 33 to 37. He spent 10 months on Guam. Guam is uh, about right along here. And then he spent two years as an embassy guard at Shanghai, China, back in 35, 36. My older brother. Now on this flight uh, from Taiwan to Saipan, no uh, interesting things to talk about, except when I got to where I could pick up the navigation station there called an Omni, I noticed I was about 50 miles north of course, and I was using forecast winds from the Chinese there in Taiwan. But from then on, on this trip, I had American forecast winds and they were more accurate. But that wasn't bad, the weather was good. <clears throat> okay, uh, from Saipan on to Majuro, we're gonna have some action on this one. Here I am at 15,000 feet in good weather. I left at daylight because I'm going against the rotation of the sun, see? Out here near the island of Kwajalein, and about 200 miles south of the island named Bikini, where they tested the hydrogen bomb, I saw something that you might describe as unbelievable. Three miles below me, there was an underground coral formation. It appeared to be uniformly just beneath the surface of the ocean. It was shaped like a spear point. A isosceles triangle. That's what made it so unusual and unbelievable. It, it, almost an exact perfect spear point. About 700 yards by 150 yards. Uniform beneath the ocean. I wanted to go down and take a closer look at it, but there at Majuro, I didn't have any contacts. I didn't know about the hotel situation. So I didn't want to lose another 30 minutes. So I went on and I didn't check it out. But I was looking at it and you still couldn't believe it because it was almost perfect I saw a triangle. I bet the U.S. Navy's got it on their chart, so they know where all those hazards are. Okay, I got to Majuro on the side of the airport there. It was a large expanse with blue plastic on it. And it was tilted in a slight V shape. And I asked about that. They said when you bore for water here for drinking water, it's salty. So they have to catch their water on, uh, this is called a catchment basin, or on your rooftop of your house. So in those small islands, they have a problem with drinking water. Big islands, they, they must not have one. So uh, I had this taxi driver carry me to the two hotels they had there, and both of them were filled up, it was about dark then. And guess what the name of one of those hotels was, Dorothy? Seven degrees north. That's the latitude there, see? I thought that was a real neat name, seven degrees north. Uh, then I asked the taxi driver if he knew of any Baptist missionaries in town. And he did. So he took me to a fellow's house named Gerganus. This is after dark. And he was what I call an independent missionary. He didn't get support from the Southern Baptist Convention. He got from individuals in different churches. 
he had a wife and three young, and they put me up for the night having never seen me before. How about that? All right. The next day at 8.30, she started homeschooling her three children ages 6 to 13. Homeschooling them out. I asked her husband about the other schools that were available. He says they were the Seventh-day Adventist school and a Catholic school available, but they chose to homeschool theirs and not send them to either one of those schools. Okay, uh, from uh, there I went on to Honolulu and spent six days there. I got there at eight o'clock one morning and, and that was interesting. I had left Majuro before dark for a 13 hour flight to Honolulu. I left on the 8th of March, crossed the International Date Line, got to Hawaii on the 8th of March. <laughs> And when I first talked to the tower about 25 miles out, I was at 15,000. No traffic involved. I was the only one out there that day. He gave me a clearance to land at that time when I was 25 miles out. You did. The way you, where you get there within a few miles of the airport. But before I got there, they landed and took off several other airplanes. But it seemed like it must be customary for them to give a long distance traveler clearance and, and let the others work around him, see? Anyway, I had a clear land there. Well, I got to Warrior, and eight hours later, my wife arrived on a 747 from LA. And my wife is Dorothy's third cousin. <laughs> <laughs> what kid does that make us? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, weather forecast from how are you to San Diego? It was it about 500 miles off the coast? I run into the tropical convergence zone. They have those all along the equator. The worst one is there just west of Africa where our hurricanes begin, a lot of them. So when uh, I got the tropical convergence zone, I had to deviate. And the procedure when you deviate on these ocean flights is turn exactly 45 degrees and time your deviation so you can estimate how much you moved off course. Anyway, when I got to where I could pick up the navigation station there, uh, LA was right on course. Now there's a lot more to this trip, but we got to get back to the south end. There's a lot of good shopping in Honolulu. Now, we're going to get back to Saipan now. In the summer of 44, we took Saipan first, and then a little later we took another island just three miles south there named Tinian. And Tinian is where we based a several hundred B-29s that bombed Japan the last six months of the war. Tinian. Also, someone came from Guam, but Tinian was closer. When I was there, 79, I looked that way, but it's several miles down, I couldn't tell anything about it. Uh, three miles of old water there, I think. Okay, in this uh, Saipan campaign, this is in June of 44, we had been capturing Isla for a couple of years, we had gotten pretty good at it, and uh, compared to Guadalcanal, I'm talking about. Guadalcanal, we had a hard time. And mosquitoes, among other things. So, uh, in the capture of Saipan, the natives there, when they saw that they were going to be all taken, put out the word to the natives that the Americans were going to kill them. A false report to the natives that the Americans are going to kill you. And that persuaded about a thousand of them to commit suicide, some of which went up to um, the northeast edge of Saipan to a high elevation called Suicide Cliff. And I think about a hundred of them jumped off that cliff. I don't know exactly, but a lot of them didn't make it because they 
kill themselves before they got there. Now, I was at Suicide Cliff on my trip. I, I run to an independent missionary there in South Bend named Berkey, and he was giving me a tour of his vehicle. Now, about 40 yards from Suicide Cliff, where there were some small trees, was a, a marble monument, like a tombstone. The Japanese had erected that monument sometime after this battle, but before I got there in 79. There's a long paragraph there in English that I would characterize as Japanese propaganda. But the gist of the message in this long paragraph was Japan will rise again. Any of y'all think they did? They did. Let me you tell you how them. I noticed their rise. Sue and I did a lot of shopping on Waukaki in 79. In 93, my wife Sue died and I married again. And in 95, I was at Waukaki again with my next wife. The prices in the show windows and all those elite shops and stores there in Waukaki was not in dollars, they were in yen. Uh -huh. That meant that those merchants expected the majority of their customers to be Japanese, either tourists or natives. So I say Japanese rose again. And I don't know why, but shortly after my round the world trip, they had a recession in Hawaii and real estate plummeted. When I got there on that second trip, every hotel they had a different name. Even the Holiday Inn had a different name. They may have different owners too, you know? <laughs> like Japanese owners. <coughs> yeah, just Japan will rise again. <coughs> Any questions or comments about this so far? I have one. Why did you leave on December the 16th, December 16th, got back 92 days later. Now, a lot of folks didn't think I'd make it back. When I departed, I heard about this later, but when I departed, the weather was 200 foot overcast there in Winona, real light rain, approaching cold front, 49 degrees, 200 foot ceiling. No trouble, the departure but arrival would have had trouble there because there wasn't any. ILS system. I got out of sight promptly on that departure, and uh, I found out later that one of my friends that I finished high school with, as when I went out of sight, made the remark to my wife, well, you say the last of him. <laughs> <laughs> what that mean? <laughs> now we gotta get back to Saipan. I heard from this missionary that prior to the fall of Saipan, the natives there were employed mostly in sugarcane production. When I was there, 30, 40 years later, most of them unemployed had a high rate of alcohol, alcoholism. So I don't know whether we did them a favor by liberating them from the Japanese or not. Now this uh, flight from LA to Hon Honolulu, I made it this plane. Before I left Hawaii, I gave my wife one of these. I wrote a note on the back of it to the captain for a DC-10. If he'd call me at a certain time out there on a certain frequency, I could talk to him. He could relay it to my wife and I was about halfway to LA. Just to reassure her, see. When he called me, he said, 
six I'm Papa, stand by. I have a VIP that wishes to speak to you. And you know, you're not going to let parents get in the cockpit. They did then, but they don't now. He had her up in the cockpit, see. Now, I want you to get this setting. I've been in the darkness eight or nine hours. Hadn't seen any lights, hadn't talked to anybody. But the weather was good at the moment. Hadn't got to that tropical conversion on yet. He said, stand by, I have a VIP that wishes to speak to you. And Sue said, Charles, uh, yeah, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> where am I? I don't have no idea. I don't know where I'm supposed to be, see? <laughs> but the plot thickens. Four or five minutes later, I saw a jet go overhead going towards that lane. Just a little west of me, and of course, a lot higher. So I asked the DC 10 to turn out his exterior lights, see if it's him, and it wasn't. And, and on that deal there, they have three tracks going from Hilo to Santa Monica, uh, Catalina Island. Three tracks, and they're 60 nautical miles apart. So I was on the middle track, and this DC 10 was on the southern track. So he turned out his lights and went him. About five minutes later, another jet went overhead. So I had to do it again. He said, stand by, I'll call Oak from Oceanic Air Control and find out about these two jets. He called me back and these two jets were on the middle track, which meant I was right on course. Yeah. And there's a high power AM radio station, I think named KTLA, anyway, it's, it's in the low frequency band there. He, this captain told me to tune that in, and I could probably pick it up right then. Well, at that time, I was crabbing eight degrees to the left against a quartering crosswind and a quartering tailwind. So when I tuned in this AM station there, it was five degrees to my right, and I was theoretically heading eight degrees to the left. See, so I thought that was awfully close. When we when Sue got off the airplane in L.A., this captain gave her a filth of wine. <laughs> VIP treatment, and we don't even drink. <laughs> I had that wine for a couple of years, and I gave it some other they wanted. Questions? <laughs> okay, we get to Amelia Earhart. Y'all all know about her. I read about her years and years ago, and recently I got a lot of stuff off the internet about her. A lot of folks have asked me what I thought about that since I was in that part of the world on this trip. Her around about a thousand miles south of mine. And you know why? The Japanese would not her allow would not allow her to go through there where she would love to have gone. They were fortifying those islands. See? They didn't want the USA to know about. It. The details. Okay. Uh, Amelia departed a town spelled L A E, Leia, right in New Guinea, and uh, went over towards Highland Island. There was a small U.S. warship there. They're supposed to help her with radio direction signals to help her find that little island. But the internet says that they think the antenna on the bottom of the plane got broken off in departing this airport in New Zealand. Anyway, they could not pick up these radio signals and didn't have any aids to help find that little island, island they never did find it. Of course, I come along in 40 years later with a lot of navigation aids and a piece of cake rough navigation. Okay, and Saipan, at Saipan, they had a, a poured the concrete small building there on the south side of the island that the natives said was a jail in which Amelia Earhart was incarcerated for a while and then later executed. Now the natives claim that, but the Japanese and American government don't have anything on it, so officially we don't know what happened to Amelia. 
And from reading about her biography, she was really interested in aviation when she was younger, but as she got older, she became just about as interested in publicity. And that may have put her on this ill-fated navigation mission. Gonna go regardless. That's just food for thought then. Okay, Dorothy, give me a question. I'm just listening. <laughs> Okay, let me see a show of hands of all of you who have been to Hawaii. <laughs> all right, now, let me see a show of hands of any of you who have been to the Taj Mahal. <laughs> really? I'm proud of you. I've been asked numerous times what was my favorite sight in the world, like pyramids and all that kind of stuff. I said, the Taj Mahal is my favorite. For those of you who haven't been there, it's so pretty when you're walking away from it, you gotta walk about 150 yards to get out of that area. You will stop by there 50 feet, turn around, look at it, it's so, it's so pretty. Polished white marble with inlaid semi-precious stones. And Santa's got a souvenir piece of that marble stuff that I brought back. It's uh, just cost 30 bucks, but it shows how they inlaid those marbles and sand it over. But there at the main building, you can hold your hand there on those walls where those semi-precious stones were inlaid. Felt just plum smooth like solid marble in, and it sanded so good. That was 375 years ago when you were young. <laughs> your grandfather was hunting rabbits and turkeys in Virginia. How many of y'all been inside the pyramids? <laughs> That's what, 4,000 years ago? A little over 4,000 years ago they built. Well, I'm about through unless y'all have some questions. John, what'd you do? Yeah. You had, uh, in Kenya, you were there on the 29th. And then you were on the on the eighth of January. You were in Sudan. What did you do those time? That time were you working with missionaries there, or what were you doing that time frame? Say that again, please. All right, you you show on your itinerary that you were in Kenya on uh, December the 29th. December the eighth. Oh, okay. Is so December the 29th? Then you say you were in uh, Sudan on the 8th. What did you do those, those that period of time? These some of the 29th? Uh-huh. I had a lot of customers, and I actually went to back in the church, so I got a bunch of mailing labels that you could type addresses on and later peel them off and stick them on a postcard. Had 185 of these mailing labels that I brought with me on the trip. So I went in a souvenir store there in Nairobi, Kenya, to buy some postcards. Bought all they had, they didn't have enough. <laughs> they go to another one. And wait for three days, I'd write, fix postcards for a while, then take a break. So I had to put on two different stamps, an airmail sticker, and this mailing label, then a little message. But about three weeks after I got back from this trip, one of those farmers, that was on my mail list, came through the office, and he had gotten one. He said, who would have thought that Charles Hull would have thought of me in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> and he got to think of that way for me. <laughs> Your world trip in Saipan, you were there two days in Saipan. What did you do during those two days in Saipan? I, I knew two missionaries there. We did a bunch of shopping among them. I, I was there six days. We did a bunch of shopping among other things. Uh, I was through Saipan, I was through there with my wife Sue in uh, 85 on my second round of road trip, and she did a lot of shopping there with those two tour guides. <laughs> now, in Tokyo,